All is right in the world when Australian rugby has two wins out of three matches against New Zealand opposition. You don't often see it, Matt Tamua, but that is indeed the result off the back of an impressive round, enjoyable round, the final, the third and final round of four matches across the weekend. Uh, But Matt, Crusaders right at the bottom of the Super Rugby table Mm. off the back of the, the force beating them. Yeah, who would have thunk it, eh? It's um, yeah, for and force for good too. Um, force, force. I thought that was uh, clearly their their best game. They've, they've showed glimpses of it. They've showed you know patches first half and a few collapses early in the season, but uh, they'll be they'll be very happy by that because um, as I said, I thought they they played well. Um, Crusaders are obviously struggling, and I um, it, it still kills me to this day. I played for a long time and only ever beat them once, and teams now are just beating them for fun. So it's uh it's a new era. Well, Nick White apparently just registered his first win against the Crusaders, if you can believe that. Yeah, I actually messaged him straight after the game. I didn't. I wasn't aware of the official stats, and I just said, mate, I reckon um, that might be your first one. I said, my memory's not very good, to be fair. Um, and he goes, yep, that's all of them ticked off now. So he might be uh, he might retiring, be retiring later this week. We'll see. Well, the other extraordinary thing on the weekend, the Queensland Reds, 31 mil over the Highlanders. You said last week that they might have they might win by 40. I thought, hang on, that's perhaps a little bit over the top with Fraser McGrath and Tate McDermott not being there. But hey, tip of the hat, you got to you got to tip right for once. <laughs> yeah, I know one out of how many. I said they'd put 40 on them. Um, I, I what I was meaning to say was that they the they would beat them by about 30 odd points. But uh, now they were good. They were really good and dominant. Um, very too often in these games, you see the Kiwi teams actually being the team that's really direct, and the Aussie team being a bit lateral. But it was a, a complete flip script. Um, Reds were really strong, and um, yeah, some a lot of players got some good good uh, good minutes as well. So yeah, good to see. Yeah, so we're going to be talking a fair bit about Super Rugby, of course. Uh, the Blues, far too good for the Brumbies. That's concerning for them, so I'm, uh, and, and Stephen Larkham. Uh, the Hurricanes, their next opponent, they're unbeaten. They're the first side this year to go to Fiji, come away with the win. But before then, we're going to actually check in with a bit of a long-lost Australian representative, a guy that was part of a Wallaby squad that you featured in in 2020. That man, James Ram, and later on, Alex Hodgman, who will be preparing to take on his former side in the Blues when the Reds host them this weekend too. So a lot on this edition of the Raw Rugby Podcast. Matt, you've got world's best dad in your title here. What's going on? I think it might be a Raw Rugby. First, I was I actually had... Um my daughter on on the front pack and but you know nowadays with our kind of new and proved male stuff you know kids at work and so i just thought i would set the standard um but i'm forking up something chronic i've just taken her off now and i've got sweat everywhere so uh yeah just learning as we go no this is what it's all about throwing yourself in the deep end and uh, <laughs> good to have kiara with us for the pod um hey big weekend of Super A, we spoke about it just a second ago, touched on it anyhow. Uh, two wins for Aussie sides. That's a really big thing for the game to get some confidence against trans-Tasman opposition. It hasn't always been that way. Mm. Uh, once again, though, it's the Highlanders, it's the Crusaders, it's the two sides towards the bottom, but you'll take it, won't you? Uh, I don't think anyone can get picky. Um, look, you beat the Crusaders, you beat the Crusaders. There's no uh, there's no fine print or asterisks in, in the record books. And, um, look, I, you, yeah, context isn't taken into consideration in that sense. So, And two really good performances, I thought, as well, from... Um, from the Reds and then and from the Force, the Force were great and and it didn't start great. Uh, I thought seeing the, seeing the uh, Crusaders first try, I thought, oh no, here we go. Um, this this could be a long night, but they they fought them fought their way back. Um, they controlled the game really well. I've been quite quite critical of their game control in the past, um, but the way that they control things and having guys like Michael Wells and that coming off the bench and having a little bit of experience around those crucial minutes, I thought was really good for them. You start to resemble a super side, don't you? When you have Michael Wells and Isaac Rodder come off the bench and you're not just pulling on someone that's just rocked up the week before into camp. 
Yeah, yeah. Look, and, and I think teams like you know the Waratahs would just be spewing at that kind of uh, that depth, considering the the struggles they've been through. But yeah, it is, and and we need to have strong benches. The bench plays such a huge role in the modern game, um, very much so uh, at the international level. But you're seeing it start to filter down um, to the provincial level. Um, you know, often they consider often the uh, criticism, sorry, of Australian teams is, oh, we're not fit enough because we we fall away in the last twenty. But when half your team's off the bench, it's 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 more often a, a fact of our our depth. You know, we don't have that depth in the last twenty, so we have to keep guys on longer. You know, and, and it just doesn't work out. So to see that starting to come up, you know, you're talking about closing the gap and and, and just slowly, slowly, just getting some guys off the bench who who, who can play some good rugby, who are. Um, yeah, you know, experienced players, um, it's very handy. There were two key moments in that second half that I thought one of them, Isaac Rodder's steal, uh, mm. really crucial when the Crusaders had been camped down and the forces half for a while. But the second run was the kick chase off the back of a turnover. Ball goes through the hands. It wasn't necessarily pretty through the forwards, but mm. it got to Ben Donaldson out wide. He hoofs it down the field. Levi Moore's got a fair bit of pressure on him. Passes it to Maca Springer, and then you've got Tom Horton and yeah. Michael Wells first there to force a, a breakdown turnover penalty. The force kick to touch, uh, and then they score two quick tries to mm. seal a really comprehensive win. That's that's fitness, that's tenacity, that's how you build an identity at a team by being defensively strong. That'll play Simon so much. Yeah, uh, they're big moments, um, you know, and it's it's very easy to look at gains and kind of look at them at these, you know, small kind of little not connected, you know, uh, things. But sometimes moments are bigger than other moments. And to have, you know, a, a fit Michael Wells fresh coming off the bench, you know, chasing down that kick, um, to have Donaldson kicking goals from, you know, 40, 45 out when, you know, they're, they're, those those converting those opportunities are really big, and I I think seeing Donaldson kick those goals as well for me as a as a fly half or former fly half, um, they're they're kind of test match moments a little bit. You know, we don't you probably don't see Carter Gordon um, because of the rebel because of the rebels um, game plan. You don't see him taking those shots at goal. The rebels will always go to line, but to see someone like Donaldson, you know, hitting those goals and having that pressure, that game control, and, and understanding the you know the importance of that moment really bodes well for for um, future selection in higher honors. That's a really good point. Hey, uh, one of your former teammates, Kurtley Beale, made a really mm. remarkable return. It was probably for what he didn't do on the field that stood out. It was just really clinical in everything that he did, and that's not always been something that we've spoken about, Kurtley, but were you surprised at how well he returned? No, I, I was excited. Mm. I Yeah, I don't know about surprise. I was I was really happy in a way, like um, just really happy for him. He, he's a guy who... You just love like and 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 there's not many people you know everyone who plays with Kurtley absolutely enjoys it loves it he's a team man and to, to see him come back as you say to see him kind of underplay his hand at certain instances but then really inject some speed and some you know he got he got a couple of line breaks connecting well with Donaldson to hear Nick White speak about his leadership role within the team um it's really cool like it's a matured man um and and it's good for Australian rugby. I'll tell you what, of all the golden oldies, uh, people might have been thinking Quade Cooper, Bernard Foley, Joe Schmidt won't be looking to Japan as much this year. He'll be probably looking in his own backyard and someone like Kurtley delivering that sort of performance, a guy that can play 10, 12, 15. It's just a nice reminder, early doors, but a nice reminder about his pedigree. Uh, we'll talk it's a nice, sorry, just before we go on, yeah, it's a nice little, um, and it's, you know, uh, I could be biased saying this, but it's a nice little reminder as well to see guys like Michael Wells, Sam Carter, Nick White, um, and Kurtley, you know, some guys who are a, a bit further past the age of 30, but seeing their role in teams, um, particularly in Australian rugby, I think we've, we're very much, you know, um, always contracted younger. Uh, but Simon Cron's really gone after some uh, other fellows who are a little bit older and, and seeing that and seeing the role that they can have in the team, it, it's really cool. I think, you know, if you look at a, a team like uh, the Tars, you know, they, they could really do with it with a few more of these kind of guys, um, you know, helping and bringing everyone through. So, it's um, yeah, it's nice seeing there's still a role for those guys in the team. 
Well, big win. Uh, sorry, a, a big match ahead for the Force. Double points is what we were saying post game against the Highlanders <laughs> this weekend coming. But a side that just beat the Highlanders is the Queensland Reds and one of their stars joining us right now. Alex Hodgman, so good to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thanks for coming on the Raw Rugby Pod. No, cheers. Thanks for having me, brothers. Appreciate it. It, it's a Monday. You've just finished training. You had a good win on Friday night. How's the body? You've just come back from an injury as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, it's 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 always awesome. As uh, you guys would know, like having a first game back or second game back, you're still a bit sore, shoulders a bit sore, neck a bit sore in the scrums. And for me, it's um, yeah, but rebuilding that confidence. So. I'll tell, you, you, I'll tell you, oh. I'm going to jump in there, Matt, quickly, because I'll tell you what, I don't know what that's like, Alex. Um, right. I have no idea, and that needs to be laid out crystal clear. My back occasionally gets sore from typing, but that's about <laughs> it. Uh, the brain of operation. <laughs> how, have, um, how have you found your transition over into Australian rugby, into the Reds? I know, um, you know, the Reds have always traditionally been known as a team that has so much promise and so much younger talent and to see someone like yourself uh come into the team you know with it with a wealth of experience and how's your role been you know in comparison to being at the blues or the crusaders beforehand and, and how have you enjoyed it uh to be honest it's what's awesome is the coaching stuff they like they enable myself to input when i need to and What's awesome is that they have a full understanding of where they want to go with the group. And then for me, it's how can I apply my knowledge in these certain areas so it doesn't step on their toes, but then it also makes the group better, if that makes sense. So. Yeah, yeah. so let, let's just expand a bit on that. 31-0 over the Highlanders on the weekend. Um, it comes off the back of three defeats. And I imagine uh, the public start to go, oh, hang on, are, are the Reds nearly as good as we thought they were or – or not, can you bring us into some of the messaging with Les Kiss and the Reds coaching staff around how that message was controlled and ensuring that the confidence is still there? I think what was good was because um, he's really strong on his belief and he's, he really believes in the team and the direction we want to play. And um, for us, it was kind of just owning your personal role. And then each moment we came together, we just talked about what's your job in that moment and how can you do it the best? that you can. So for us, it was, um, it was quite simple when you nail down what's truly important to you as a player and how you can influence the game in that moment. So, and I think um, our mentality throughout that whole week, it's we nailed it compared to how we had been against the last three games where we tripped over in those last minutes. So, Very much the um, kind of the yardstick that we measure ourselves upon in Australia is how we go against the Kiwis. And, and having yourself or someone like Jeff Tumung Allen who, who who grew up and played against these guys, is there? do you feel a, an increased responsibility when you play against the Kiwi guys to, to, to say to the, you know, the lads, you know, listen, they've only got two legs, they're just like us or, or, or whatever. Do you, do you notice that kind of increased responsibility in those matches? I feel like those conversations have been had for a long time. Like within the group so for myself and Jeff it's how can we keep this energy alive within this group when mm. things go bad or when things are going right how do we keep that flow and how do we continue to like be like hey let's go back to our process instead of let's oh we're getting too hyped up in this moment we're getting too excited and then we throw like a silly pass or we do things that are out of character so for us it's kind of Okay, how can we regather this group and how can we bring that energy when we need to? So, this weekend, another New Zealand opposition, and it's pretty important for you. It's up against your former side, the Blues. Has the messages already started? The sledging between the two uh, camps? Have you been copying anything yet? Nah, so, and I'm, I'm a Reds guy. That's the thing. So, um, <laughs> but as you know, like you have your time at, at, for me, I had my time at the Blues and, but for me, it's I'm fully committed to here and our vision and what we want to achieve. And uh, for us, I can't go into game plan, but it's um, it's pretty awesome at the moment. So, yeah. Well, and and you know, it's it's very clearly working. I think um, you know the Reds at home in Suncorp is is a different you know proposition very much so. And I'm actually keen to put your other hat on when you were a Blues member and Eden Park. 
like for, for Australian rugby players, for Australian supporters, it's it's horror. Like, you know, I have PTSD from there. You saw the Brumbies play there on the weekend. Um, very uncharacteristic errors. It, what is the home ground advantage, whether it be there or whether it be at Suncorp? What what do you think as a player is the difference? Because, you know, from a viewer's perspective, it's it's very evident. I think there's just like a certain pride you hold. Like for myself growing up in Auckland and going to like watch NPC games and and then watching the Blues play and then finally getting my opportunity to play for the Blues. Like I didn't want to let my city down. And there was just like this feeling of like a fortress. And like when you put on the jersey, you're like, you've been given a gift. And and like when you've been given that gift, you want to do it to the best of your ability and you don't want to let your family down and you don't let your friends down and all these amazing fans who support you. And like, I remember guys like they'll fly over to our way games and like, for me, that was special. And I was like, man, I don't want to let these people down. And then now that I've moved to Suncorp, I can like feel the passion. eh? And there's something special about Queensland and, and um, just the people here, they're like, they fully believe in you. And like, as a player and as a person, like, like it just raises your spirits and you're like, man, I'll do anything for this group. And then when you look at the group, you're like, man, I love these dudes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> like, you know, and like, you know. And that, that's okay in the modern age. Don't worry. Yeah, it's all yeah. good now. <laughs> uh, like, you know, like, you'd like, you'd put your body on the line for them. And like, yeah, and that's, that's what I've felt since coming back into the group. I'm like, man, these guys are, I can see them putting that and I want to do that for them. And yeah, so it's kind of like, you put your own expectations higher than, you know, what other people think and you want to get to those standards and you want to do these things. And when you succeed, man, it's the greatest feeling ever. So it's nice to hear you um, like, you know, cause in the question before you're talking about process where, whereas clearly now you're talking about an emotional connection and element, and that clearly motivates you to, to do things a bit further. Yeah, of course, man. Like, like I brought my family over here to Brisbane and like uh, I want to give them the best lifestyle that they can have and for me it's and that's just playing my, my heart out that's making sure I do all my work I do all my I's and cross all my T's and and then when I get that opportunity and the coaches believe in me I don't want to let them down so but yeah very I'm, emotional <laughs> yeah so I'm I might ask you in a moment um, around what you think is coming this week having played for the Blues but just on the the Eden Park, you played a test match there. It uh, might have been one of your first games, perhaps your debut at Eden Park against the Wallabies. Did you feel that expectation even more? And did you feel a sense, like, was it different at all, um, knowing that it's 1986 the last time the, the Wallabies beat the All Blacks at Eden Park? Did you feel anything different or was that expectation a powerful thing in a positive way when you ran out for the All Blacks that day? I think for me, it's it was kind of just believing in myself because there's a lot of great players that they could have chosen and they chose me and they put that, you know, they gave me the black jersey. And for me, it was like, I'm not worried about the opposition. Like, I'm more focused on how can I influence this moment. And I felt like when I came on, I did a pretty good job. And But like anything, you know, um, you got to re that jersey. And that was the... That's the thing, you know, like you know, is that like it, it can be given to, you, but it can also be taken away. And for me, it was just I want to live this moment out. <laughs> my family's here, my friends are here, and yeah, I just want to give it everything I can. So when I look back, I'm like, man, I gave it everything that that day, and then I can tell my kids about this. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's great as as I say, rent's due every week, isn't it? And you got to prove yourself all the time. It's um. It's nuts, but like I, I don't know about you, but um, you know, I know for in Australia when we have a game at Suncorp, it, it, it guys get a little bit more excited. Um, you know, we yeah. feel a little bit more confident. Is that the way with the Kiwis? Like when you when you know you're playing at Eden Park, um, I know facing um, New Zealand, it was always a different proposition than say it was in Dunedin or, or, or at Westpac. Um, Eden Park just seemed to have it always just seemed to be more behind it. Yeah, man, like, I think there's just a lot of history there. You know, there's a lot of great history. And I think knowing that you're that guy in that jersey, you don't want to let it down. And 
I, I feel I feel the same way when I go to Sunport now. Is man, there's so many great games that have been played there, and there's so many great players who have put their jersey on, and I just want to do those guys proud and unwear that jersey with, you know, like yeah. <laughs> I just don't want to let it down. That's the thing, eh? So, so Alex, the uh, the Blues are coming this weekend. Your former side, Saturday evening, Anzac clash. It's going to be a cracker. Not many sides have been able to handle Vern Cotter's pack. They, they look like they're going through teams more, a bit of a Northern Hemisphere influence, I'd say. Um, it looks like a test match kind of influence, bashing teams up through the middle before going wide, and there's pr- plenty of threats out there. How do you, as the Reds, adjust to kn- knowing what's going to come at you? And then how do you think you're going to actually be able to stop it? I think for me it's physicality. Like... I was watching their game against the Brumbies and I was like, you know, I was getting jittery. I was like, man, I want to, I want to be in those moments. I want to try and dominate those collisions. But as a group, it's, it's once again, like not getting sucked into those moments and being like, Hey, like what's our game plan, which I can't go through, but what's our game plan and how can we execute it the best? So, uh, and it's, it's a, what I, what I like about that group is they are very physical and it's, it's actually, um, it's going to their strengths as a pack. So for us, it's how can we nullify that strength? And no doubt it's going to be, I reckon it's going to be one of the best games this season. So yeah. I think we're, uh, we're all very excited um, to see it. And as, as Christy mentioned, it's, it's Anzac weekend. Um, I like, you know, me, myself, I was born and raised in Australia, but I have a Kiwi heritage. Will, will you be singing both anthems? How do you find that? Like I, I always found that, um, not odd, but you know, it's very much the modern day player. We have kind of a connection with Australia, you know, myself, Samoa. Um, but you know, playing in these games, it, it must be like you must be singing two anthems almost. I kind of I remember on my All Blacks debut when the anthem was playing. I didn't actually sing because I like to be in the moment and I like to feel the moment. Mm. And I felt if I heard myself singing, I was like a bit tone deaf. But um, I think uh, weren't 660 singing it as well, so you'd probably yeah. ruin it if you sung yeah, it again. You just got to appreciate the free concert. So for me, yeah. I, but like, yeah, I was just trying to, I was just, I kind of feel like just take that moment and, and like, and like just embrace it as much as I could. And I kind of feel like I'll do the same this weekend where it's, and like, you know, it's, it's massive game, you know, Anzac and, I, I I can't even talk about the sacrifices and stuff because obviously like they're amazing people and what they did for us. And um, for me as a player, it's just trying to make sure that um, you know, I just embrace that moment when it comes. So sorry, man. There's a lot of moments I'm talking about, but that's that's kind of how I live my life. Yeah, you're you're an emotional you're an emotional being. It's good. Yeah, it's great yeah. to see. Um, I, I I know that you're not going to say I, I I you know deserve selection. Uh, Wallabies is still a few months away, um, but when there's a guy like an Angus Bell who gets injured, um, which is really disappointing for him to see, it allows opportunities, presents opportunities for others. Is that something that you know being able to return to the park recently off the back of an injury, international rugby, um, Wallabies eligible? You are. Is that something that you're still very much keen on on doing and getting back into that international game? I think for me it's kind of it's it's a tough one because I'm still in my in my mind, I'm still not playing to my full capacity yet or my full potential. Like I looked at the game and I found there were a lot of flaws in my game. Then I'm like, oh, I want to work on those things first before I even think about, you know, the next step. So I think what's good in this group here at the Reds is there's so much competition where if I start looking too far ahead, someone's going to slip under me and take my spot. So it's, yeah, I understand what you're, what you're saying in terms of, man, hey, someone's down, I can go. But for me, I just want to really nail my finer details because, yeah, I'm still not quite there in my mind. So. Well, there's there's many games this weekend that are going to be ones to look for out for this weekend, but the Reds and Blues on Saturday evening, it's not going to be too many that top that one. Uh, thanks for coming on. All the best this weekend and really nice to cut, touch base with you and, and, and have you join the pod. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>
Awesome, bro. Thanks a lot. And um, yeah, I really love what you're bringing to Australian rugby. So um, yeah, appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Good to speak to Alex Hodgman. And he's a guy that I'm sure will be entering the wall of his discussion if he can stay on the field. He's got good work rate, good feet at the line, and a guy that loves the ruck. And that's what Joe Schmidt's sides are all about, ruck speed uh, and getting quick ball for their their backs. Um, it's going to be an awesome game this weekend. Uh, what do you think the Reds, 31-0 over the Highlanders, that's not necessarily a barometer because the Highlanders are struggling. They're not in a great space. But what do they need to do this week against the Blues to ensure that they stay in the fight and do uh, something that the Brumbies weren't able to last week? I think what you said there, the, the fight, it, it, it is going to be physical. Um, you saw how how the Reds beat the Highlanders, and sure, it's not a great barometer, but, you know, they can only play the team that's in front of them. Um, so it is a good start. Um, the Reds were so direct, um, even without a guy like Tate. Um, you know, you, you saw Kalani Thomas having a few snipes. You had a, saw a few guys picking, and I think that really direct game is is, is what's going to do it. That's and, and ironically, that's actually how the Blues beat the Brumbies. They were just physically dominant, and it was very, very evident. And um, yeah, that kind of home team. You know, they they they. they they kind of batten down the hatches a little bit and just go through you. And, um, yeah, I don't think there's going to be any secrets and now it's going to be one. I think there's two players to me, maybe three players that if I'm a Reds player wanting to play for the Wallabies, you need to step up this game. And that's Ryan Smith, mm. uh, I, th I think, uh, Harry Wilson and Hunter Paisami. Those three guys uh, perhaps on the fringe uh, for someone like a Smith, physicality is something that he said he needs to work on. Um, he's not the biggest guy, but he hits rucks, and that's important. Um, those three in particular, uh, do, you, do, you, do you think that I'm on the right path there? Yeah, or, or I, I, I think with yeah with, with Tate gone, with Fraser gone, the, that's kind of your emotional heartbeat of the team. Um, and... Look, we, I'm sure we might speak about it later. You know, in Australian rugby, we really need some second rowers who have got some grunt and who can really impose himself physically. So I'm sure that's where, um, you know, a guy like Smith will be thinking. Um, I thought Hunter was really good on the weekend. Um, he was kind of that triple threat 12, um, which um, we've kind of gone away from a little bit, but I thought it was really good to see, you know, passing, kicking, running, um, and, and it will be good to see him do it against, you know, a strong Blues back line. Yeah, exactly, and that's the thing. They've got threats all over the park. But someone like a Hunter, he's – some people like what he offers, the punch in the midfield. Others mm. probably bemoan the mistakes in his game, um, perhaps a little bit loose at times uh, with his with his handling. Where do you see a hunter by Sami in the, the conversation of, of Test Footy? I think he has to be right up there. The thing I like about Hunter is it would have been really, really easy for him as a uh, physically, you know, strong player to kind of not try and grow his game. And I think the 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 error here or there is is, is him trying to grow his game. Like he's kicking a crossfield kick probably the, the wrong way around to, to Sully on the weekend. You know, he's doing a nice little short ball. And I think, yeah, th there are going to be a few growing pains. Um, he's going to develop as a player. Um, but to have that skill set, I think, will pay dividends um, down the track. And he's probably in a similar vein as like a Tom Wright. Um, you know, do you want him to go really quiet and just become like a kind of average beige player? And, and they're not those kind of guys. They're guys who want to be game breakers. And I think, um, yeah, I, I I am a very, very big fan of Hunter. And I think, um, yeah, I, I just really like the fact that he's developing other parts of his game and he's not just become this one-dimensional player. I think of a guy like Martin Nonu, who was a huge you know, runner, and then he developed a short kicking game. He developed a really good passing game, and it it, it, it grew things. So I think, um, yeah, it'd be great if Hunter could go along that path, I'm sure. But, um, yeah, it, it's good. I think he, he'll definitely be in the conversations later on. And the other thing about Hunter's game over the weekend against the Highlanders was uh, he underplayed it at times. He, mm. he jumped into first receiver a lot. You saw a bit more distributing. He took ownership of the game, and and maybe that's something he hasn't always you know, done effectively. Yeah, and I think um, it, it's a really it's a really good point, and that you're saying in terms of him underplaying it because that's you know the tendency when you are say very um, direct or whatever is to try and 
prove that you're not <laughs> and go a little bit too wide or a little bit too chip kicky. But to, um, to see Hunter, as you say, go to first receiver, just play up the next guy and, and not necessarily look for the for the um, try scoring opportunity instantly is, is a huge growth in him. And it shows that mentally he's probably starting to grow a bit. And um, yeah, it's I think it's exciting things. Really devastating for Jordan Bataille. I left uh, around that half hour mark, I think it was. And um, my understanding is he'll probably miss the next three months. Uh, so he won't need a full-on construction. But that's a that's a big blow. And it, with him and his future not quite sorted, it, it may, you know, if you're Joe Schmidt and you're thinking about Wallabies, it just leaves a little thing going, well, He's not playing consistently at the moment. He's not going to be around for a little while. Um, if he's going overseas and that, or if he's changing codes, um, mm. that's still to play out, then maybe I'll look elsewhere. But it's a big blow for, for Jordan and, and disappointing because he's had so many injuries over the ever since he made his debut, I think, in 2017 for the Reds. Yeah, it really has. It's um, He's had, you know, obviously a family member of mine, so I don't really want to, you know, I'm, I'm biased in that sense. But I... I like Jordan at 13, and to see him at 13 on the weekend, I was actually a little bit excited. I feel that's his probably his best position because it, it, it allows him to assert himself physically, both defence and attack. You saw him, you know, in 30 minutes hold up a guy and they get a, a turnover. And I know as in Taco, if I'm, I don't want to be running down Hunter Paisami and Jordan Pitai, you know, in the centres. And, and I don't know if we've always had that kind of um, fear in Australian rugby in our, in our midfield. And so, yeah, it is disappointing. And, look, I'm sure he'll come back stronger and strong. Um, unfortunately, it's it's something that he's had to do many, many times. Um, but, yeah, it's a little bit disappointing. But, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm sure he'll come back. It's it's interesting you, you say he, you think his best spot could be at outside centre. I don't disagree with you either. Like, mm. The ability to shrug off defenders – uh, he did that even back, I think, in 2020. Richie mm. Malunga was just thrown away. Uh, mm. And you know, he, he played quarterfinal in 2019 at, at, in the number 13 spot. And Eddie Jones similarly saw him as very much of a part of his team in the outside centre position. Yeah, I think it, it allows Jordan to play a little bit more instinctual rather than, say, a fullback. I think fullback's got a, a bit more, you know, tactical now, depending on. And, and the... The issue, well, not issue, but the, the good problem you've got with Jordan is he can play everywhere. You know, from 12 out, he can play it at a, at a um, international level. That's That's been proven. Um, but, yeah, I just think instinctually it allows him to just play a bit more instinctually. It allows him to assert his physical dominance because he really is a, such a physically dominant player. Um, and I like that. I think he's a really good defender. Sure, he can kick as well. Um, but... For me, that doesn't mean, therefore, you go to throw him at fullback. I think, um, yeah, I like him close to the action. I like him really getting amongst the tough stuff. Um, but, yeah, hopefully it's not long before we're, we're, we're seeing that. But, as I said, it's, geez, it's a good issue to have to say, oh, geez, I don't know where I fit in the Wallabies back line because there's, there's options. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, anyway, best of luck on his recovery. It's a, it's, a, it's a big blow, particularly with Josh Fluke. He might be touch and go this week, but... If you're losing two of your outside centers, that's going to stretch them. The good news is Lawson Crichton had one of his stronger performances when he jumped into 12, and uh, I think that was encouraging to see. We know Patsami can play at 13 as well. Tarjan, another guy there. So a few more options still available. James O'Connor, probably not too far away either. Um, might not have the gas to be at 13 anymore, but um, the Blues, they're going to be such a – Big effort uh, for the Reds. They were far too good for the Brumbies, 46 to 7. Did you see that coming? Uh, not to that extent. Um, I thought this Brumbies team maybe just had a little bit more underbelly. Um, but at the same time, mate, I've, I've been a part of many teams who have gone to uh, Eden Park and had our pants pulled down. Um, yeah, it, it really was. There, there, there are quite a few things that were a little bit concerning. Um, Caleb Clark just running over Noah for a try. Like that, you know, if I'm an All Blacks team and Noah's at 10, I'm going to run Caleb Clark at him because I know I can score. You know, there, there are a few things that, yeah, a few un, uncharacteristic errors as well. Little, you know, just before half time, the little kick that goes out on the full and essentially gives them a. But, yeah, I don't want to be too kind of critical because Eden Park does that to you. It's an it's an odd place, 
Um, it's very, very hard to play. And, you know, the, a Blues team is, is good anyway, but they're, they're exceptional at Eden Park. And um, I think you saw that. It's a really good point you make. Uh, I, I tend to think off the back of the, the Chiefs' heavy defeat in round two, heavy defeat to the Blues, this one against the Hurricanes, which is the other strong New Zealand side, uh, this weekend they're going to host them afternoon footy, Saturday afternoon. It's a game that they need to ensure, the Brumbies, that they rock up, that they deliver because I think it's almost three strikes and you're out. And if you know a Lolliseo or a Ryan Lonigan, you've got to step up and show what you – there to be counted for otherwise he's just saying to joe schmidt i can't handle those big games against physical oppositions yeah yep and and look with we saw uh the brumbies play amazing against minor um a few weeks ago and you know you see tom wright and noah doing really really well and 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 um these games do hold a little bit extra um value i think um i'd like to see i know it's, it's a very minor point but tactically i'd like to see the brumbies shift Corey to the left wing. I know on the weekend he wore 11, but he was wearing the right wing. Um, you know, traditionally your left winger gets more opportunities because he's coming off a right-hand pass. Um, so you get, you know, usually you put your best finisher on the left side and, and you probably saw early in that half, Ollie Sapsford didn't quite have the gas that Corey did um, to finish that try. So I'd like to see them um, switch him. I'm not sure why that was the case. Um, but, you know, as I say, it's minor things. It's got to be. It's got to be physical. And and Hurricanes have just they've you know there's a reason they're undefeated. Physically, they have been amazing this year. Um, I you know it's they they have bullied every single team. And you know it will be a different proposition in Canberra. But uh, the Brumbies will have no you know they, they'll know what's coming for sure. Just on the decision making and the tactics as well. The first half they had five entries into that twenty two. They had multiple inside the opening 20 minutes when the game was there. The game was there to be taken. And mm. I've seen Wallabies teams miss and fail to be able to take those three points on offer when they're shooting at goals. And it just compounds. And it felt mm. like it compounded for the Brumbies on the weekend. But how do you go to Eden Park and decide, I'm going to take a quick tap you know, straight off the back of a yellow card? Uh, why wouldn't you go to set piece there, Matt? And something that's typically been a really strong uh, attribute of the Brumbies in the last mm. decade. Yeah, ma maybe it's a maybe it's a little bit of a you know Brumbies trying to reinvent themselves. Um, you know, I don't know if the set piece is as strong as it used to be. Um, you saw the Brumbies turn down a mall opportunity, go down the front, and then you know get knocked up, knocked knocked the ball on um, as a twenty two entry. So yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if it's a trying to grow the game. I don't know if it's a not a huge trust in things gone past. As I said before. Um, Often the thing about Eden Park is, you know, when you watch a highlights package of a game at Eden Park, you'll see offload, step, whatever, in, in minute 50, minute 70. But it is always direct, physical. And any time that I've gone close there or, or I've only won one game there, it's it's through boring, physical, you know, really direct stuff. And I think that's often where we go wrong is we think it's going to be this, you know, game of, um, you know, step and offload and whatnot. But the, the, the Kiwis at the breakdown are the best in the world. And, and that's often where it's, you know, the tone is set for sure. Yeah, I think they missed Alan Alatau, his leadership there. But it's a game that you want to forget, but it might be one that Joe Schmidt remembers for quite a while when he starts to sit down in, in the months to come. But... Did you notice some um, kale at centre at the end of the game? Well, I found that interesting. You know, in the last year or so, with um, Eddie's very much been about you know trying a few guys at um, you know sevens players or, or whatnot. And um, yeah, Dylan you know, Peach in the back row or yeah, Josh yeah. Kemley on the wing. Yeah, Josh Kemley yeah. on the wing. Yeah, yeah. I saw um, kale at centre at, at one point. And I was like, oh, that's that's very interesting. I, like, um. You know, when you start talking about Wallabies and you start talking about, okay, can, is he better than, say, a Siri Uru? I don't know. But if he's a guy off the bench on a 6'2", who knows he can play in the back line, that's a, that's a little feather to your cap, I reckon. That's one to do a bit more probing on and, and keep your eye out. That's mm. great analysis. And this is why you get paid the big bucks, Matty. It's huge for. bucks, mate. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, they certainly aren't. But... That's um, that, that's interesting regarding Kale because if you think about mm. the Wallabies at the moment, um, there's not too many big ball running twelves like Hunter's 
not big, I wouldn't say, but he hits really hard. Mm. But it's an area where if you're wanting gain line advantage as well, that's something that we know. We've even spoken about Michael Hooper in the past. Could he be in one of a twelve and? I think you've seen the. Um, I think we've seen the the moment with the last World Cup with South Africa really being quite brave in their selections with the seven one bench and having guys like I think it was a Dion Ferri who can play you know in the front row, but he also plays back row and sure he's got history of doing so. But like that's really interesting. I think we might see a bit more kind of creativity in that space. And you know I, I'm by no means suggesting that Kale will be selected at starting twelve, but. If he's on the bench and, and you go, oh, you know, should we go a 6-2 or a 5-3? And you can go a 6-2 knowing he can play in in the back line. As I say, it's a huge feather in your cap. It's a big um, it's a big asset to have as a player. It's it's I don't think it's as um, you know, I think Sevens has really changed that and having the ability to have, you know, tackle, pass, breakdown, all those skills really helps in that area. Well, that would be a fair bit of innovation from the Brumbies, and it's something that you like to see uh, more of. Uh, they're up against the Hurricanes this week, and we know that the Brumbies have a really good record against the Hurricanes. They knocked them out of the quarterfinals, I think, in the last two years, uh, both at home. So Controversially. <laughs> yes, yeah, very controversially. Artie <laughs> Sevilla still got uh, – he's still seething still from filthy. that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and, uh, he's Kobe – so I didn't have a, a great weekend either on the no, Japanese no. League one over the weekend. Finals sorted for that season, uh, it looks like, mathematically anyway. So um wouldn't rule the Brumbies out this week, but it's going to be a big one and it's a, it's a really big game for those fringe Wallabies. And right across the board, uh, the Waratahs and the Chiefs are going to be playing as well. That's a massive game. It's a, it's a huge game for... Guys like Will Harrison uh, uh, to be able to see if he can back it up. But the forward pack particularly, your Ned Hannigans, your Lockie Swintons, they've got to continue to do the business. I think you'll see Mark Noing and Edouasi come back. I wouldn't be surprised uh, if there is a bit of a tweak to that back line. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's a huge game in the context of the Wallabies because it's the first time this year that there'll be five trans-Tasman fixtures with the Rebels also heading across the ditch to the Crusaders. Yeah, look, I, I think you're spot on. It, it is a bit, and some games do mean more, um, and and these do. You know, like yeah, Waratah's amazing effort against Crusaders, but, you know, Chiefs at home, big game. Brumbies, you know, Moana at home a few weeks ago, really good performance, great, but Hurricanes at home. Like, these are games that we need to start winning, and I'm glad that we're getting picky with which Trans-Tasman games we want to win now um, because in the past we would just take any. But, yeah, I, I think these games do mean more, and they're, they're evenly matched. It's fair to say that the Brumbies have been the top side in Australia for quite a while, and they're, they're against the, the top side in New Zealand at the moment at home. So it's, it's a game that if they have um, ambitions to be champions um, that you want to win. And it's a very warm welcome to James Ram. James, so good to have you on the program. I know that Northampton's been going extremely well, mate, but just speaking to you for a hot second beforehand, what's going on with your accent? <laughs> oh, gosh. it's uh, I get this all the time. I think I sound very Aussie. I think I'm still... Uh... You don't. You definitely don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Look, uh, product of your environment, aren't you? <laughs> Yeah, you're not wrong about that. So for those that don't know, James, part of Dave Rennie's, one of his inaugural squads in 2020 with the with the Wallabies, uh, but you found yourself at Northampton. You left in 2022 when you've been kicking goals left, right and centre. And another one on the weekend, 40 to 17, the Saints beat Dan McKellar's Leicester Tigers. Let's just start there for a, a second. That's a great win, but it consolidates you guys at the top of the table of the English Gallagher Premiership. That's a massive one for your ambitions of finishing minor premiers, right? Yeah, 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 huge. The uh, the Leicester games out Derby week, really. Um, so it's 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 massive for us, and they they got it over us in the earlier in the season. So uh, we thought, you know, we own one at least. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was packed out stadium and Derby week. The fans love, so it was it was unreal to get that win. Yeah, I know it's a uh, it's a huge rivalry, the East Midlands Derby. I, I still remember back in the day going to 
Asda and people would be talking to you about the game. They would love it. You you probably shop at Waitrose though. Um, oh. I'm assuming. <laughs> Ram, but uh, no, mate, a oh, big win. Um, yeah, they're, they're huge games, and it's it's kind of hard to compare it to anything over here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is really different. I think just like the the amount of history that the two clubs have and the proximity to each other, um, you know, makes it so sort of it is a bitter rivalship, uh, rivalry. Sorry, and uh, yeah, and like I said, sort of the the stadium being packed out, and they're not massive stadiums, but it feels like. There's such an atmosphere there, um, and it's really enjoyable to play in front of that. Hey, why did you end up going overseas? Because Matt had already been to a World Cup by the time that he decides to to head to the Tigers. Why you and and fair bit earlier in your career? You would have been only oh no older than twenty three by the time you left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd always always thought I'd play overseas at some point, um, and honestly thought it would be back end of career um, to go in and try something different. Um, but the opportunity came up and I just had sort of a season full of injuries. I, I think I did three or four things back to back, sort of my first game back, I'd do something different. Um, and I'd had a year like that two years prior. Um, so I just hadn't had much game time. Um, and sort of what the premiership offers over here is plenty of games. Um, I think this season, as an example, I sort of did my knee. I was out for three or four months and, played five games before that and have the ability to come back and play about 12, which is an entire Super Rugby season. Um, so I just needed a bit of game time. And I thought, you know, after a year of injuries, a uh, change of scenery, go and grow my game, expand it, and uh, enjoy the beautiful weather over here, I guess. <laughs> and the East Midlands there. Um, yeah. Obviously, since, um, since the premierships narrowed it a little bit and you know two teams have, have dropped out the the competition is just it's ridiculous isn't it like i think there was two points separating eighth from second or something like that on the weekend it's it, you know obviously not playing in australia but you're you're over there now and you're playing big games every week like it, it it's only got to do wonders for your career yeah 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 i think the the biggest part was coming over here and becoming a better player for sure um and like you said, I mean, the, the past four games we've had, we've had Saracens we played, who are reigning champs, and we had Munster at home, then we had the Bulls, and then we had Leicester the Derby week. Um, I mean, four massive games. Next week, we play at Twickenham against the Quins. Week after, is a semi in Europe. You know, so like being exposed to those kind of games can only, can't be a bad thing. Um, and yeah, no, I, I'm absolutely loving it. Yeah, so it goes without asking, really. You are loving your time over there. Uh, I, I suppose you're thrilled you made the decision to leave the Waratahs when you did. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't an easy decision at all and um, sort of probably would have been a bit more comfortable to stay. You know, I knew everyone, all my mates, all my schoolmates, everything were at home, stay with the family. Um, but sort of making the decision and committing to it uh, has been the best thing ever. I mean, I came over with Ali, my partner, and um she's loving it as well it's just also such a life experience we're an hour away from london um you know we're experiencing such different things and yeah no no i'm quite happy has she picked up the uh, english accent as well mate or is it just you <laughs> i think she wants it really badly she's a bit probably a bit more aussie than i am um sort of her parents are all very aussie and her accent's a bit stronger than mine but uh she's trying to pick it up and mate you're only only 25, I think, which is um, a little bit scary, but I, I dare say you still harbour ambitions to, to play on the international stage. And as you said, you're playing Twickenham this week, week after, I think it's a sold out Croke part of 82,000. Like that, you, you, you've, you know, arguably that's probably a better stepping stone into inter international uh, duties than, you know, playing in, um, in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. I think every sort of, every player harbors those those wants to play international rugby and it's definitely definitely what i'm after um and to be exposed to this kind of rugby i think i think there was eighty two thousand tickets sold in a day for croke park so i think that atmosphere is probably as close as you'd get i mean yeah i wouldn't know matter you'd know but um i think to play in front of a crowd like that will be such a, a life experience yeah so those that don't know uh less uh northampton rather to play Leinster, no bigger challenge, but in the European Champions Cup semi-finals, 
can you afford to look that far ahead just yet because it's still a week and a half? We know the old cliche, it's it's one week at a time, but it's you know, I imagine that the excitement's already building. Yeah, I think I think it's uh it's it's tough not to, but it is important not to as well. I think it, it was tough when we found out where the semi was gonna be and who against that you, you acknowledge it and then you sort of think, okay, we've got Leicester, then we've got the Quins, and then we can think about it. So it's been mentioned, but um focus is definitely on sort of the next games because it yeah i mean we to win these next couple of games would be massive for us in in terms of the premiership and, and, and what about your future um is there the possibility of coming back to australia like you and matt to would have been teammates for the wallabies in in 22 in, in 2020 rather but you didn't get on the park so i imagine that there's still a the possibility that you might actually even play for england one day uh is that a thought here have you considered what you might do in terms of trying to get onto the international stage um i think the way i sort of look at it is that if you take care of sort of your club rugby and you're playing your best rugby then whatever comes from that does and i'm i'm absolutely loving the rugby at saints at the moment um and i mean any any opportunity to play international rugby i would i would jump at um 100 but yeah i think that only comes from playing well with your club and enjoying your rugby and, and making sure that your focus doesn't sort of drift too far off. You know, we, we've success with su- successful teams usually get a lot of international players in. And I think if you do well for your club, then you're, you're putting yourself in a good chance for sure. Yeah. I think it's a really good um, mindset that you're taking that you, you know, you've gone over to saints for um, development, you know, to become a better player and, as you as you said, we, you're playing Twickenham this weekend, Croke Park the weekend after. Like, I, you know, that's only ever going to help that. And and what will be will be after that. And would love it if it was in a gold jersey. Um, but could, can you do? Do you know the English national anthem? I know they've changed from Queen to King, and that complicates things for a few people. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's why I'm working on my accent, isn't it? That's what you were saying before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. No, who, who knows? I mean. Um, like I said, to play on that stage would be is the ultimate goal. So yeah, we'll uh, hopefully wait and see. And do you um, do you much? Do you watch much Super Rugby, or do you keep in contact with um, much things coming back here? I know you know it's uh, what a few more, a couple more months, and then it's off season. Will you will you come back home, or what, what's the go there? Yeah, I do. I watch a fair bit of the Super Rugby. Um, do a lot of the the snippet highlights. It's sometimes played in you know over the through the night over here. Um, and I keep in touch with a fair few of the, the Tars boys still. I actually just been over back to Australia for my sister's wedding a month ago, um, which was really nice. I mean, it was a hit and run job. I was there for a week. Um, so you're just getting over your jet lag and you leave again. But I uh, caught up with a couple of guys there, um, which was really nice. And I'm always staying in touch with the, the Aussie rugby. You know, you're always checking the scores. It's uh, something nice. Yeah. But I um, don't think I'll come back in the off season. Um, I mean, I've got all of Europe to travel here. You know, why why go home for winter when you've got a European summer? Yeah, very true. I'll be over there actually uh, in about a month's time. But uh, you've just re-signed as well for Northampton, so you're not going to be coming back anytime soon. How, how long is the actual deal for? It's uh, two two years, two more. So two after, two more seasons after this one. Yeah, yeah, okay. So easy decision to stay. Well, Matt, you, you guys, t- teammates, twenty twenty. What have you noticed, seen about James and the ability to play fullback is is an obvious one. You've spent a fair bit of time there for the Saints so far, but wing as well. What have you noticed, and what did you notice about James back in twenty twenty? Yeah, I think one of the things I've spoken about a little bit um, has been the physicality of our back three, um, which is something that I, I, I like. And and James obviously brings that very dangerous runner, can play in all three positions. And I, I really do, just speaking to you now, uh, James, like hearing that, you know, that it was a it was a development decision, you know, and, and kind of taking that step by step process or, 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 you know, thought towards his, his development. I think that's really good. Um, and we've seen many guys go overseas, come back. Hopefully he doesn't end up in a white jersey. But um, in saying that, it, it would be a little bit nice, you know, for you to get those, uh, to achieve that. But, um, yeah, I think we, we would love to have someone like him back in, in a gold jersey in a Lions tour. But, um, yeah, we'll see where it ends up. 
And what's it like, James? You've got a pretty exciting back line there, Tommy Freeman and, and so forth. Uh, is it Finn Smith at, at 10, um, Alex Mitchell at 9? Like it, it is an exciting back line that when you were at the Tars as well, you know, this was a young team that was just finding their feet. Here you're, 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 you know, there's a, littered with English internationals in that side that are only going to get more and more experience in that white jersey in the coming years too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're dead right. The back line at the moment is is a bit crazy. I mean, and the depth. I think we rested and rotated a couple of boys for this last game, and just to see, you know, if the the people who are coming in to play all and still put guys. forty on us too. Jesus, <laughs> want to mention that? But yeah. <laughs> uh, it is incredible, and playing with those guys makes everything a lot easier for you. I mean, if everyone's doing their own job the team's going to go well and you're able to sort of shine and do what you want. Um, and the way that Saints play is very much about expressing yourself and going out there and doing what you like to do. Um, the coaches really push that. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, like you said, it's it's littered with England internationals, but they're also quite young. Um, Tommy Freeman's t- low 20s, 23 maybe. Uh, Mitch is a year old. Alex Mitchell's not too old. George Furbank's there. Fraser Dingwall, I mean, I think most of the back lines actually capped for England, um, but they're all quite young. So um, I think only bodes well for the future, really. Well, the win over the weekend didn't help McKellar's Tigers, who uh, will say languishing in eighth, but as Matt alluded to, there's not much between them and, and the finals positions. Um, did you get the chance to see Dan on the weekend? I imagine he would have been pretty grumpy off the back of that defeat. Yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't catch him, um, unfortunately. And yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they're, like you said, they're sitting in eighth, but there's only a couple of points from them and, and second, maybe third now. Um, so I think they've got all to play for for the rest of their games. And um, I mean, yeah, I wish him wish him all the best being in another Aussie, but uh, thankful that I don't have to play them again. Uh, and what about uh, Angus Scott Young? He's another guy that headed over at a similar sort of stage to you. Um, he might have been frustrated not to get a, an opportunity in that national kind of set up for the Wallabies. But uh, to the two of you, are you instantly best mates because he's the token Aussie there or, or because Lucan was there last year? Like, Was there someone that you're gravitating towards more? Yeah, I mean, you, you hear the Aussie accent in the change room and you do feel a bit more at home for sure. Um but yeah, no, Gus and I are really close. He's he's around most weeks for dinner. He's uh, yeah, he's he's like an adopted little little son. Um, are, son. Are, you, are you guys the only two who wear uh, budgies in the change rooms? Because I know the English nudity is just they're, they're a bit more liberal, aren't they, than than we're used to? Yeah, very. I think that was a bit of a shock. Um, but we're slowly turning them turning them towards the budgies. We've had a couple of uh, Saints budgies drops, which is quite nice. There's a couple. Yeah, nice, yeah. It's always good when you can, like, tell the lads, oh, I know someone at Budgie who'll, who'll sort us out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, makes you feel quite famous, doesn't it? Oh, if yeah. you feel weird, you should come to the onsens in Japan. Jesus, it's uh, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> you can I think that's for another show, though, to be fair. But um, anyway. <laughs> yeah, the roar after dark. Um yeah. Hey, hey, James, really good to have you join. And it's an exciting month ahead for you, uh, exciting next six weeks. There's so much rugby, as you said, that's played. But from an Australian speaking to another Australian, he could be turning English uh, at some point in the near future. Good luck. Uh, and that opportunity to play at Croke Park, not many players get to experience that in this modern era. And, and that's going to be an exciting one for you. So... Hopefully, uh, it's a successful one for for the Saints. Yeah, no, thank you very much, guys. I've uh, loved hearing some some more Aussie accents. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ram Jam. Appreciate it, mate, and uh, all the best. Hey, James Ram is a really good guy, good player, former the gymnast. There's a lot more we could have touched base on with him, but nice to see. Nice to former see gymnast. Why didn't well. you bring that up? Well, I don't know how you didn't know that, but it was probably the story that was doing the rounds back in the day. He, he uh, as a kid, right throughout, even up until about high school, I think he was he was on the beams and everything. But uh, Jesus, good it's, on it's no surprise that he's doing well in the outside backs and finishing tries and uh, mm. had another good role to play on the weekend. 
let's touch on the Super W final uh, and and hopefully we'll be speaking to one of the players next week, uh, whoever wins that. But the Super W final on Sunday mm-hmm. at 2pm up in Ballymore, probably slightly surprising, a little bit interesting, perhaps perplexing that it's up at Ballymore, um, given that the Waratahs are going to be hosting the Fijiana Drua in a repeat of the 2022 final. Yeah, it is interesting. Um, it's it's a really um, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing with with what's going on in the women's game at the moment. Obviously, with Ballymore being the um, home of the Wallaroos, you know, we want to start doing that. But at the same time, do do you want it to be in Fiji or do you want it to be in um, you know in New South Wales? I'm not sure, but look, I think it's um, it's exciting that things are moving in a positive direction. We're seeing um, a standalone final. We're seeing more and more, and I think it's it's um, yeah, it's great for the for the women and the young girls watching of of something to aspire to for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a really good win over the Brumbies. The Drua had a a win over the Western Force. That's how we end up with these two sides here now, the final two sides. Um, I imagine the Waratahs, I think they're going to be too good for the draw. They mm. they slipped up against them in 2022, uh, but I can't see that happening this time around. They've just been far too clinical, scoring tries for fun. And you know, finals footy, sometimes you can be a bit nervous. They were still far too good for the Brumbies women's side, winning by 20 points, uh, far too good. Yeah, and I think, um, look, if the game was over in Fiji, it would be a completely um, different proposition. It it is quite of a weird one, um, and we're not at the start of the year, say, when, um, you know, Queensland is probably a little bit like Laotoko or Suva. Um, It's probably not going to be too hot for the the, um, New South Wales women. But, um, yeah, look, I think think they won the first three, um, and then they've had a little bit of a break last couple of years. So I think... um, There'll be a little bit of a, a chip on the shoulder for the for the Tars girls, and um, yeah, it, it, it'll be a good game to watch. Yeah, totally. So they're pretty well uh, in terms of their health, a full bill of health there. Uh, Piper Duck, she was in great form today with the announcement that the Wallaroos have a new principal partner in Cadbury coming on board. Not just the men, but the women. Uh, my understanding, it's it's a deal up until 2029, which is fantastic for the game. It's completely necessary if there's going to be full-time contracts and professionalism come into it. But my understanding is that it will get up towards about a million dollars a year. Uh, that's a really promising thing uh, for the Wallaroos because you compare that to only a few years ago where they were having to take time off work Hmm. Being completely shortchanged, having to rock up to training after work. They didn't even have the coat of arms on the Wallaroos jersey up until about 2017. Hmm. Uh, this is a huge step forward for women's rugby in Australia. It is. And, and it's nice seeing, look, with our, and to be fair to Rugby Australia, our women's sevens team really led the way um, with with a lot of professional contracts, whether you, you know, compare it to the NRLW or even cricket or aflw you know our, our, our girls were held in such a high esteem they had an amazing program and but it's probably come at the cost of our 15s program um but having that 2029 um world cup is kind of like a you know an, a name point for us and to see some corporate support now um once that starts happening you know maybe we can start getting a few um girls and women from the from the nrlw into the program and you know have that little carrot and and can hold us up in high esteem and as i said to have some corporate support and some genuine corporate support not some you know companies trying to uh, improve their csr or whatever but to have some genuine money behind it is awesome because um yeah we can we can really start making some headway now yeah so i feel war uh, several of the Wallaroos, including Eva Capani, were there today at Allianz Stadium for that announcement. It was a really well put together run uh, event, uh, which is pleasing to see. So those little things that go a long, long way. And for the four Wallaroos that were there, that is just another example of the improvement uh, in quality i think across yeah. both the men and the women's I, program i would say to the to the women uh team though don't get too excited because you don't get that many blocks of chocolate we got some maybe the first couple of weeks in um 
so Cadbury started sponsoring the Wallabies in I think 2020, and we found a few boxes and and you know Taniella and that would hide it. But uh, after that, they got banned very very quickly. But um, <laughs> it's very much a financial commitment rather than a uh, free kit or whatever. So um, nah, it's awesome. It's awesome. Good That's stuff. true. Joe Yap was there, the Wallaroos coach as well. She's excited by what she's seen, and she's pointing towards the uh, improvement over the last week or two in the standard. But she also was a bit, uh, I'd say, disappointed at the fact that the season's just really started to hit its strap and then it's over. But um, final this weekend, Wallaroos, uh, Pack 4 coming up, an important match against the US. If they win that, they secure World Cup. Uh, they secure their... Um, status in the top league for the women's game, which is really, really important. Uh, and it's a big stepping stone ahead of next year's World Cup in England as well. So um, good things ahead for the women's game. Looking forward to talking more around that final next week. Um, but until then, I think that's a wrap, Matt. Thanks for coming on and farewell to the world's best ad for this week. <laughs>